What do trenches and cages have to do with growing the reddest, ripest tomatoes you ever saw? Well, you're about to discover how to use these easy and unusual techniques and some others to grow the earliest, healthiest tomatoes in your neighborhood. Coming up next on The Joy of Gardening. I'm your host, Dave Schaefer. There's nothing like the flavor of a juicy red vine-ripened tomato. And master gardener Dick Raymond grows them earlier, easier, and tastier than most anyone. He's here today to tell us how he does it. Tomatoes are the most popular vegetable in the garden. Hi, I'm Dick Raymond. It's no wonder they're so popular. Just look at the size of these and all the colors and shapes that there are. These here are my big boys. Just look at that beautiful, beautiful tomato. I'm gonna slice it in half. Just show you how juicy and ripe it is inside. Isn't that beautiful? Just one slice covers a whole slice of bread for a sandwich. And these little yellow pear tomatoes, Simply wonderful for making pickles. You know, I like to experiment with different varieties. And I found these to be really good. And of course, I like spaghetti, and the sauces, and the paste. And these little Romans work real well, and they're shaped sort of like pears. But my really old standby is the pixie tomato. And pixies, people think, are very, very small tomatoes. And they really aren't, because they're really good size. The real small ones are the cherries. And of course, they're great in salads because you can eat them whole. And they work wonderful in dips, too. There are many tomato varieties that you can get, but you have to start some seeds indoors if you're going to get the kind you want. Now, these are pixies, and they've been planted a couple weeks. And as you can see, they're doing real fine. Because when you go to the market to buy plants, they only raise certain kinds. This particular flat here, this one's ready to, to uh, transplant. These are some of my later tomatoes. Now, I'm going to transplant this in this milk carton. And as you can see, I've cut holes in the bottom of it so that it will drain. We don't want any water to set in there because the roots will rot on it and the plants won't do well. Now, I'm going to take one of these plants out of here. We'll pick a good tall one, just like that. Now, if you look very closely, you'll see that the roots are small and there's a lot of top. So what I'm going to do is pick these leaves off. I love to pick leaves off of plants. Looks like you're being cruel, but you're not really being cruel. I'll take one more. There, we get it right down to there. There. Now, as you can see, I've got a small top and a small bottom. So I'm going to transplant this in all the way, this whole stem right up to my fingers. Then all this stem is going to become roots. In this, when I get this all firmed in this container, within about, oh, three weeks, all this milk carton will be nothing but solid roots. And the stem will be very, very large. And the plant will be about this high, and it'll be ready for hardening off. Now, to harden off a plant means that you have to get it used to the outside weather. And if you treat it like you do yourself, you won't have any trouble. Simply take it out for an hour or two the first day and a few hours more the second day so that it doesn't sunburn and windburn. And don't forget to water. Because this is very important because this plant, we just put it into a shock there. Be very liberal with the water. Now, if you keep, don't raise your plants and you're going to buy some, it's very important that you really look the plants over. And here's what you should look for. You should look for the very, very dark green top. This makes you, tells you that the plant is very, very healthy. Also, you want a very, very rugged stem, a big stem. If it has a big stem, you know that it has a good root ball on it. And one other thing, don't buy the little spindly ones like this, because as you can see, there's very few roots, and it's pale, and it's not very healthy. And also, be sure you look under the leaves because a lot of times there's white flies. And of course, you don't want anything like that. I'm planting my main crop of tomatoes. 
Those are the ones that I make juice with and we can for winter. They're also the ones that grow very, very tall. Those are the indeterminate ones. I'm putting in some big boy. They'll have tomatoes, hopefully that big around. the nice, red, and juicy. Got to add a little compost here because I want to be sure that they have enough fertilizer because these are real big plants. Covered up with a little dirt. Yeah. These plants are really beautiful. I started them about nine weeks ago indoors. Transplanted them a couple of times. And just look at these. They are simply beautiful. The roots on them, sure gonna get a crop with these. You got to take the leaves off. I even do this with big plants like this. I know it looks cruel. There, right off to there. We don't wanna forget to put a cutworm collar on. Gonna make the hole a little bigger here. There we are. Cover it up, right up to the top of the stem, and right where it comes out of the ground, wrap this cutworm collar. By getting this stem buried like that, and these blossoms here, the first cluster of tomatoes on this plant are gonna be right here at the ground, instead of halfway up the stake. And these plants are gonna get very tall, so I'll actually get more tomatoes. I'm gonna stake this one. You can buy these stakes at the store. It's four feet tall. And I like to put the stake in when I plant the tomato, because I know where the stem is. If I waited a week, I might drive the stake, stake in and break the stem off. You can really drive them in the ground, good and solid, because there's gonna be an awful heavy load on this stake. Now, one thing to really remember is always put your stake so that the prevailing winds blow the plants against the stake and not against the tie. And it's the same is true if you're putting in a trellis for well, these flowers or even for cucumbers or something. But my favorite way is to use a cage. I make my own cages. I simply go to the hardware store, buy some regular turkey wire, and it's available at all hardware stores. You can buy some your regular cages already made if you want, but I like to make my own. And all you need to do is to cut about four feet of wire Hitch it together like this. And what you've got is a 16 inch diameter cage. Plenty big enough. But when you buy turkey wire, one problem is that they're just two, two inch squares and you can't get in to harvest. So you just cut out a couple of wires so you can get your hand in to get the fruit out. And it's very easy to put them on. Just put it right over the top, just like that. Just push it right into the ground. There. Now all I've got to do is to train this tomato and keep it inside of this cage. It'll grow right up through the top, fill this full of, of tomatoes and, and the foliage, and even spill over the top. Now there are three ways to grow tomatoes. If you've got the short kind, you can simply let them sprawl. If you've got the tall ones, you can stake them or you can cage them. And this is my favorite way to grow tomatoes. I want to show you what happened to this tomato plant that I set out here six weeks ago. It was about this tall, and I stripped all the leaves off at the top, too. I dug a trench, and I laid it down in the trench with a root ball right here. Then I covered it up with just two inches of soil. And I did that because I wanted these roots to be right up near the surface where the sun could warm them, because tomatoes are heat-loving plants. And that stem that I buried all becomes roots. And by having a good rugged root system like that, it gives you a very, very rugged plant. As you can see, where it comes out of the ground, how large it is. In fact, look at that, the cutworm collar is still there, the piece of newspaper. But the real advantage to this is, the, not just the roots, but look at where the first fruit are set, right at ground level, right here. And that means that if I had to set this plant standing up like this, the first tomatoes would have been up this high. So I probably will get two, three, might even get more clusters of tomatoes than I would have if I hadn't have laid it down. Now let's dig this up and let's just see what happened in the ground here. Boy, it doesn't want to give up. Look at that. There. Let go. There. 
Just look at those roots. Isn't that something? This is the little root ball that I had right here when I set this out, just this little tiny amount. So all that stem that I buried, look at the roots that's on it. I mean, just isn't that beautiful? And the thing is that each one of those roots is gathering moisture and fertilizer to feed this plant. And that, of course, is why it has such a rugged stem. So by planting your tomato plants lying down in a trench, you get a much better root system. And you also get heat to the plant so you have early harvest. And you get a rugged stem. And of course, you get the tomatoes set right at ground level. So if you use this technique, you're gonna get tomatoes and a good plant that bores fruit all summer long. I'm tying this tomato to the stake because I'm getting it ready for a real heavy harvest. If I don't tie it, it's gonna fall right on the ground. One thing you have to do though with your tomatoes, especially if you stake them, is you have to take all the suckers off. And the sucker is this little thing right here. And this really is the size when you're supposed to get them. When they're like this, simply pinch them right off, just like that. If they're big like this one here, you'll have to cut them with a knife. These suckers will grow everywhere a leaf branch is, like that. One of these suckers will grow, and it's really another little tomato plant. Just cut it right off, just like that. And here's another one here. Just the right stage to, cut, to take off, just pinch it off. And you have to do this every two, three days because they really grow fast. Now I've tied one tie to the stake, now I'm gonna tie another one up here. It's very important when you tie a tomato that you don't get the string tight or whatever tie you use. Like I'm using some real paper uh, tie here, but you could use some socks or whatever. Make a loop in it and tie it loose around the stem, but very tight around the stake. And I wrap it once around the stake, just like that, so that it won't slip down. And tie it good and tight. Now, as this grows, I'll tie it right along up to the top. Because I really want to get some good big tomatoes and a heavy harvest here, I have to side dress this. And this is just the right time to do it because it's just starting to set fruit and it's blossoming good. In fact, here's some fruit right here that it's set. Now, I make a circle right around the plant, just like this, a little trench, and I spoon feed it. And this is a big plant, so I'm going to give it a couple of spoons full because it's going to take a lot of fertilizer to feed it, but you don't want to overdo it. This is 5-10-10. I don't want too much nitrogen. And be sure you cover the fertilizer up so that the leaves don't touch it, because if it does, it'll burn them, just like that. And I'm going to water this in because I want it to really get started. Really soak it right in, in good shape. Now, early in the year, when I set this out about six weeks ago, I didn't want to mulch this plant because I wanted the roots to get the good warm sun. But now that it's starting up, and if I don't mulch it and keep the moisture in the plant, what's gonna happen is that we're gonna get blossom end rot. So by putting a good heavy mulch on there, it's going to keep the moisture in the ground and keep this plant growing good so that we don't have any blossom end rot. And I wanna put a good lot of mulch. Don't be afraid to put too much around your tomatoes. Just like that. I use straw, but you can use anything. In fact, I'm gonna put about eight, nine inches because I really want it to hold the moisture. So now, I won't have to water as often. In fact, I only need to water about once a week. I'll give this a good inch of water if we don't get a lot of heavy rain. And if I keep the suckers off and tie this way to the top, I'm sure to get a good heavy harvest. This is what tomato growing is all about, the harvest. And just look at this cage of tomatoes. Isn't it beautiful, all those red, ripe, juicy tomatoes in there? And it takes a little space. But you know, a lot of gardeners really worry about their tomatoes because they start to take funny shapes and crack and some of the leaves die. But you don't have to worry. Just take this tomato, for instance. It isn't ripened yet, but as you can see, it's cracked like that. It doesn't hurt the tomato at all. When it's ripe, simply pick it and cut it right off. This one up here, it's got what we call cat facing. And it's just starting to get it. It's got one ring on. They probably will have a couple of more. And this it happens simply because the sun was out for several days, then it was cloudy for several days, and then the sun came out again. And when it does this, the tomatoes grow and stop growing and grow, and this is what happens. Another thing 
a lot of the leaves start to get discolored and to go bad on the plant or die or whatever. Just look at this one, for instance. It's got the blight. Doesn't hurt the tomatoes at all. Simply, the leaves will get yellow like this, and eventually they'll fall off, probably in a month or so off the whole plant. But don't worry about it, because it doesn't hurt the tomatoes. And do let them ripen on the vine, if at all possible, because they're much, much better. Just look at that beautiful tomato, how red and delicious looking it is. Just cut it in half and just see. It's sure to be ripened all the way through. Just look at that tomato. Mmm, nothing like it. The first food for my garden every year is a salad, and I love it. The salad greens look terrific, taste great, and they're so easy to grow, too. In fact, you can grow all these things in just one row, along with carrots, beets, garlic, and more. It's a technique Dick Raymond taught me, and he calls it a multi-row. A multi-row just a few feet long will allow you to grow all the salad your family needs and still leave plenty of garden space for those crops that demand more room. What a beautiful day to be out in the garden. Sun is out, it's warm. I've got some plants ready to set out. What could be better? I'm gonna put out some head lettuce today. I'm gonna to plant it in a wide row in what we call a 3-2 pattern. This simply means that I'm gonna make a hole here for one head, go 10 inches, make another, 10 inches, make another. Move down the row 10 inches, make two. Then go down and do the next three. Now what happens to this is, as this lettuce grows, it'll shade all this ground and it'll keep it cool and moist. And that's really what head lettuce needs. Also likes a little extra fertilizer, so we'll give it a little. Be sure you cover it. You can use commercial if you want. I'm using compost. And here's the very important thing about head lettuce. The roots are very small and the tops are very large. So I'm a leaf picker. By taking some of these leaves off, you're gonna give this top a real head start. Don't take the center leaf off. Simply set it in the ground and firm the soil. Looks kind of cruel, but it really isn't. The plants love it. You don't have to throw these away, you know, you can eat them. There. This one looks a little better. It's got a bigger leaf on it. There we are. And the other very important thing, of course, is to water, because these plants really need to drink. And you do this a couple of times, maybe tomorrow or the next day. And always label. There. Now, over here, I'm going to plant a salad garden. This is my favorite way to plant, because I get so much more in a little small area. I'm going to plant a three-foot salad garden here. And I'm going to have to add a little extra fertilizer. I put some on earlier, but we'll give it just a little more right in the row. And of course, we don't want the seeds to come in contact with it, so we'll mix it in. There. Now, what I'm going to plant in here is I'm going to plant carrots. And I'm going to plant spinach. And I'm going to plant lettuce. And I'm going to plant radishes. But I'm not going to stop there. I'm also going to plant some onion sets. Now, the seeds are fine, and they're kind of hard to spread. So I have already put the carrots and the lettuce in this little shaker that I kept. It's a, simply a garlic bottle. And this is the way I plant my wide rows of fine seeds. These are all mixed. I put it on just like you would putting salt and pepper on an egg. Simply sprinkle it right on the roll, over the whole area. There. Then I want to put some radish seeds, and I put a few of these. They come up very quickly. And you'll have something to eat within, oh, maybe 22, three days. And spinach. There. I don't want to forget to put the onions in. These are easy to plant. You simply grab them by the top and just push them in the ground, full depth of the bulb, just like that. Doesn't make any difference where you put them. Just push them in, just at random. You can put them three, four inches apart, five inches apart, or put them close together. Depends on how fast you want to eat them. There, and then remember, you've got to firm them. And I like to use my hands in the soil. I really love to feel the soil. This just feels so good. 
day like today, boy, it's just wonderful. There. And I call this my chef salad. And I'm going to plant a whole row of this. And here's some of the other things I'm going to plant. I'm going to put some mail order onion plants in. I'm going to put some garlic in with some beets and some of the other things. Here's some beets and more carrots. And this whole roll will be an entire salad. But I really like spinach. And I'm going to plant a wide row of spinach over in the other side of the garden. I plant a lot of spinach. I like it fresh in salads, and I like to freeze some to cook in the winter. The only way I can get enough salad, spinach and canning spinach, is to plant a wide row of it. And I'm going to just sprinkle a few seed on here. You, when you put spinach in, you should put it all two, three inches apart, three, four. Doesn't make any difference if you don't get them just perfect. One other thing that I do, I always plant radishes with practically everything in my garden. In fact, it's the big sweet I have. And the reason I do this is because when I put the radish seeds in, no matter what I plant them with, they come up in two, three days and mark the roll. And then in about 20 days, I have something to eat. And when I pull the radish out, it leaves a void in the soil and it actually cultivates. And it lets the plants breathe. And of course, that's what they have to do. Now you firm them down. And I like to use my hand a lot in the garden because the soil just feels so good. It puts you right close to Mother Nature. I plant Bloomsdale because this is always a sure crop here. It, I plant it early and it comes early. And you do have to plant it early because if you don't, it'll get uh, bold and you won't have a good crop. But I don't plant just spinach. I have another green that I really like. And it's Swiss chard. What I like about this is that you plant it once and it's good all year long. Now I plant two kinds. I plant the red and the green. I like the red better, it's ruby. And again, uh, the seeds are very much like beet seeds and there's a reason for that. Because they really are bottomless beets. That's what chard is. And you sprinkle these just as you would spinach, three, four inches apart, just like that. But you know you can't plant all vegetables in wide rows. Some of them have to have special treatment. Celery is one of them. Celery likes rich, moist soil. So I've dug a trench here that's about nine inches deep, and that'll collect the moisture to provide the celery with a good growth. And I've also put some compost in, but I want to put some more, because I want to be sure that it has plenty of fertilizer there. And when you plant celery, you also have to take some of the outside leaves off. Just like that. I'll take off this one there. And plant it right down in the bottom of the hole. And plant it about an inch deeper than it was. Just like that. Remove some leaves. And be sure you firm the soil. Very important that you seal up those roots. There. Now what's going to happen is, when this celery starts to grow and gets about this high, I'll start filling in this trench until I've got it level. If I don't, the celery is going to be dark green and quite strong. But by filling this trench in, you really blanch this celery. You make it nice and white and crisp and real sweet to eat. You know, we spend hours preparing the soil, getting the seed bed ready and planting the seeds. And then they finally come up, and when they do, there's something we all have to do and no one likes to, and that's thin. I watch people, and they go and they spend just hours just pulling this one and looking down in there. And every time they pull one, it's just like they're destroying a friend. They feel that, well, if I pull them out, I'm not going to get a harvest. Well, this is probably one of the most important things you can do in the garden is thinning. Because if these plants are too crowded, you're not going to get any produce from it. But I like to do it the easy way. I use an iron rake. I simply take it and I draw it right across the roll, just like, oh, that's painful, just like that. Don't look down. If you do, you're gonna be very upset. It really looks awful. When they're thick like that, I actually go the other way, just like that, sort of corner way. It really looks like I've done an awful job here, but I really haven't because I've taken some of these plants out, but I've done something else. I've really cut down about half of the weeding in this roll. Because when I drew the tines of that fork across the roll, with the teeth going in just about a quarter of an inch, 
I killed weed seeds that were just germinating right on top of the soil by disturbing them. And in just a few days, this will come right back. Now over here, a couple of days ago, I drew the rake through here. And as you can see, it's already popping back. In another couple of days, you look at this and you won't even see where I've taken the rake and drawn it through. Of course, you can do this with all the greens. And then all you have to do, hopefully, is very little weeding and a lot of eating. Salad greens are one of the first delicious harvests in the spring, and my chef's salad row is really ready for harvest. I have everything growing in here, and it's all crisp. I'm gonna harvest some spinach. Just look at that spinach. Isn't that crisp? There, boy, that's gonna be good. And I want some lettuce. I'll simply just pinch this off, just like that. Boy, is that tender. I pulled some once in a while, but I don't worry. There's so much in the row, I'll have a big harvest. I want to add some color, so I'll put some ruby in. And a little black seeded Simpson. All of these flavors are really delicious. And of course, onions. They really make a salad. And I just love to grow onions this way because they're so tender. Just look at them, they're nice and that long white on them, it's so sweet. Oh, we'll take one more. There. And of course, what's a salad without radishes? And as you can see, this whole roll really is a chef's salad all in one. Just look at those radishes. I need one more, there. There, now there's enough for a salad, but I have a friend that really likes spinach. And I'm going over to a wide row and harvest some spinach for him. I harvest spinach differently than I do when I'm harvesting my chef's salad roll. I simply cut the whole crop off, just like this. Cut it right off, just about an inch above the ground. Just look how much harvest there is in this row of spinach. Now what happens when you cut it like this? It's what I call cut and grow back. Now in just a few days, this will start growing again and I'll get a second cut from it. And I harvest all my greens that way. In fact, just look at this here. I cut this just a couple of days ago and it's already growing back. Just look at this basket of greens. And this is only part of the variety of salad greens that I'm gonna harvest in my garden this summer. There are a lot of other greens you can grow in your garden besides lettuce and spinach and chard. Just look at these collars, for instance. Up north here, you very rarely see a row of them but I like to grow them. This is my fall crop, and I'll be able to harvest collards here way into the winter. It's a real good crop. But my favorite's over here. It's kale. And kale is one of the richest in vitamin C that there is, and that's why I like to grow it, because it's really good for you. Aside from that, I'm going to be able to harvest kale from this wide row all summer long and right into the winter. In fact, next January and February, I'll be able to dig these greens right out from under the snow and have them fresh on my table. Years ago, kale used to be very, very important, but now with modern shipping, lettuce has taken the place. But you know, there are many exotic greens that you can plant in your garden, but I do recommend that you try kale. You'll be amazed at the flavor. If you want the true flavor and crispness of head lettuce, you have to grow it and harvest it right in your own garden. Just look at these heads. Just look how beautiful they are. This is what wide row growing can do for you in head lettuce. This is my famous 3-2 pattern where I planted three heads and then two heads. And as you can see, they form this living mulch. All the leaves touch together. And by doing that, they shade the ground and the weeds can't grow. In fact, I haven't even had to weed this row. And look underneath them the leaves, and just see how moist it is in there. And of course, it's nice and cool because shady soils are cool soils. And that's what head lettuce has to have, is shady, 
with cool and moist soils. Now, by removing this head from this pattern here, what happens is that this hole will give room for all these other smaller heads to grow and expand and fill it right back in. So I'll be able to harvest these heads in a couple of weeks from now. But gardeners really make another mistake when they grow head lettuce. They wait until the head gets big like that, and that's not what you want. What you want is a head this size. It doesn't have to be any bigger than a softball. That's when the good eating is. And if you start harvesting like that, or heads this size, you can harvest and eat for about three weeks on a roll like this. I like to keep all my garden soil producing vegetables, so as soon as one crop is gone, I spade it up and I plant a second crop. This is spinach here, and I've taken two harvests off, but it won't grow back, so I'm spading it up and I'm going to plant a second crop of beans. Now, I could have planted either beets or carrots, or even some late peas if I wanted to. But the main thing is that when one of your early crops has gone by, plant a succession crop. I've been harvesting celery here all summer long for salads and soups. Now it's fall and we're gonna get a frost, so I've got to take this in. Early this spring when I planted this celery, Remember, I put it in a trench. Well, I filled the trench in as the salary grew, and then I sort of mounted up the soil and hilled them. And I did this to blanch them. I like to blanch them. As you can see, it gets white down where the dirt is, just like that. Makes it a lot milder. There. To harvest, I use a fork, because there's an awful lot of roots on salary. It's really hard to pull it up if you don't loosen it in good shape. Just pull it right out. Just look at the roots on that. See how beautiful that is blanched. Isn't that just wonderful? I've tried to store this many, many ways, but I find that celery doesn't keep well in the root cellar. So what I do is I cut the top bottoms off just like this. Boy, this is a good one. There. I'm going to wash this celery and put it in the refrigerator. I find it'll keep about three weeks there. I've tried to store it many, many ways. I've dug it up, taken it in the root cellar, and replanted it, and it never seems to keep. So either put it in your refrigerator, can it, or freeze it. That celery certainly looked good, and so did all those other salad vegetables. With salads like those, you almost don't need a main course for your meals. I especially like Dick's multi-row technique and his way of planting head lettuce in that 3-2-3 pattern. I hope you'll try out some of those ideas in your garden, especially if you only have a small space. And don't forget the wide row way of growing spinach. It all adds up to more food from your garden and a bigger helping of the joy of gardening as well. Add a little spark to your pepper patch. Use book matches. Hi, I'm Dick Raymond with two surefire methods to get good peppers every time. Peppers like sour soil, so I have a special method that I use to make the soil sour. I use book matches. They contain sulfur, so that when you add them to the soil, it becomes sour, and that's what peppers like. I put six or eight book matches into each hole, about eight inches deep, and that is plenty to sour the soil. Peppers also need something else. They need fertilizer, so I spoon feed them. I give them just a little, in fact, this is a teaspoonful. If you give peppers a lot of fertilizer, they'll grow very, very tall. You probably will only get two or three peppers, but give them just a little and they'll stay short and bushy. And you might get as many as 20 peppers from one plant. Be sure to mix the fertilizer and book matches into the bottom of the hole. Then cover them with a couple of inches of soil before you set the plants in. You don't want those roots to touch the fertilizer or matches, because roots will burn if they do. Use book matches and a small amount of fertilizer and watch your peppers grow. Mm -hmm. 